Hi, everyone. I'm Steve here again for our weekly interview with Dr. Nario. Thanks for being with us, doctor. Hi, Steve. Thank you for having me again. Always a pleasure. Okay. As you guys know, Dr. Nario is with Biointegrative Health Center in Reno, Nevada. You can check them out online and see what kind of treatments they do, what things they treat. Um, they do a lot of IVs <clears throat> and so on, but a lot of cool treatments. So they're easy to find online, Biointegrative Health Center. So we're going to talk about cholesterol. Boy, cholesterol is very controversial. Uh, especially when it comes to heart disease. But I don't think you're really going to talk about how it's associated with heart disease. Uh, so we're going to talk about cholesterol in food. And first, tell us about this study. Well, Steve, uh, let's kind of give our audience a little twist here. We always kind of, let's give them a curveball. We always think of cholesterol and people discuss cholesterol in relation to higher risk of strokes and heart attacks and cardiovascular disease. But there's one thing that's kind of not getting noticed. What about cancer? What is their correlation between cholesterol and cancer? And this is something that has been now, I work in a cancer center also, and this is something that I see every day. This is not something new. So how this all started was when they were seeing colon cancer being more prominent uh, in the 70s related to what people are eating. And usually they, they saw that when people are eating um, high cholesterol sources or high dietary fat, they saw that their rise in incidence actually goes up and higher. And what is the explanation of this? So during that time, they saw that the body makes its own cholesterol, right? And when we consume extra cholesterol, meaning as the, as the gut says, hey, we can only absorb this much, we're going to throw it out. We're going to spill it, meaning the excess. So it goes down our colon, and the lining of our colon actually absorbs this spillage. And imagine if somebody didn't do their colonoscopy, and they have a polyp or a growing tumor, right? Now this precancerous lesion will actually be washed with this cholesterol and it's almost like fertilizer and it makes it grow faster, makes it worse. And thus they determined that, yes, um, there is now a correlation between um, cholesterol intake and colon cancer. So uh, tell me about the study. I mean, how was it done? You know, is, is this a good study? And when was it? This, you're talking about a new study that you're referring to, right? right. Well, this one I'm, I'm actually pertaining to the in the 1970s. So this is the older study because now they have a newer one. Uh, and actually, because this kind of like spark that the newer study, which is actually a 40 year update after that 1970s trial. So now they're actually going deeper into the just the effects of cholesterol, not only in forming colon cancer, but other cancers as well. Okay. So, I mean, is this like a double blind? I mean, yes. Okay. And then, then, and how, do, how did the update work? Did they, how, how did they relate everything from the past study? Right. So now, so this is actually a nationwide population uh, based study that they did. So this is not just one facility. It's all over the nation. Right. And now after that 40 year follow up of a study, they actually saw that it actually is also responsible, cholesterol is also responsible for the increase in stomach, colon, rectum, pancreas, lung, breast, kidney, bladder, and uh, lymphoma, or even bone marrow cancers. And, and that's why this is where it's going, that the recommendation of uh, diet low in cholesterol really plays a big preventative role in not only colon cancer, but these other cancers that I just mentioned. Okay, so the cholesterol, there's cholesterol in food. Um, is this a certain type of food or is it just any cholesterol in any food? Right, so that's a, that's a good question, Steve. So what they're going with here is any, any type of food source, meat, dairy, eggs, uh, can act, who, which contains cholesterol can contribute to this cholesterol load that we're talking about that can fire up uh, cancer. And, and that's why uh, you would hear different trends on how people kind of manage through this. But 
again, the escape is really very low when you're exposing yourself to this high amount of cholesterol in your diet. Okay, so, and you, you mentioned this, you also work in a cancer clinic in Reno, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, right. So, um, how much cholesterol can you eat? I mean, what is what are the findings of saying, okay, don't eat more than this? Or how, how, right. how is what, what what are your recommendations? Or what what are what are you taking from this study? Should you not ever eat cholesterol? Um, no cholesterol, or only get it from certain sources, or tell us a little bit about that. <clears throat> right. So what, in, in relation to the study, what can guide us? It's, it's a pretty straight up uh, guideline that it's saying, keep your cholesterol levels in check, meaning get them in normal ranges, right? So usually for cholesterol, total cholesterol, 200, LDL, 100, um, HDL, it's a good, it's the, our good cholesterol. They don't bank on that that much, but it's only those two. If you keep those levels in check with, with your, of course, regular testing with your primary doctor, uh, that's a good gauge to do that. But you mentioned a while ago, how do people kind of flip around with this? So you would always hear uh, our, our, maybe our options out there that, oh, I think it's heavier to have beef as a source of cholesterol. I'll just take chicken, right? Because it's white meat versus red meat. So the thing here really is switching from red to white meat wouldn't make a difference according to the studies. And it's really no surprise to us. Why? Because now fat have been fat and chicken have been genetically manipulated these days ten times more fat than they had a century ago, and this is comparing it to to beef, right? So there are and, and as an evidence for you, there are a number of cuts of beef that have less cholesterol raising saturated fat than chicken. So no surprise that white meat was found to be no better than red. A good example for you would be a skinless chicken thigh, right? And versus a T-bone steak or a tri-tip steak. For the skinless chicken thigh, it's 9.2 grams of fat versus T-bone steak of 8.2 and the tri-tip being 7.1 grams. I mean, th those are guesstimates, but as you can see, and what we're talking about here, genetically, commercially available chicken. It's not your organic, thin, skinny chicken walking in the farm. And that's why this becomes a misnomer that, hey, let's eat white meat because it's healthier. Okay, so I think I hear you saying, correct me if I'm wrong, that eating meat, whether it's chicken or <clears throat> red meat, that's natural, um, it, that's organic, depending on how the animal's fed and so on, is going to be healthier. So just because a chicken yeah. is leaner doesn't mean that it's not a risk, a potential risk here because of the type of fat that is in this chicken. Right. So when you say leaner, right, when we, we think it has all muscle rather than fat, you have to remember these steroids, these antibiotics actually increases the, I mean, even though you see muscle, these are muscles that are actually ins in inserted inside it would be cholesterol and fat if you're eating these genetically modified um, sources. But if eating pure organic chicken, then you're getting really the pure substance of uh, non-chemically injected uh, type of meat from a chicken, which is pure when it is a better choice. Okay, so... You said, <clears throat> you talked about, you know, how everyone goes, hopefully everyone goes every year or twice a year, like I go at least twice a year and you mm -hmm. get your cholesterol and you get your blood panel and all that done. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you're saying you want to keep that in, into whatever the blood work right. categories are a healthy range, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so you're saying that now eating certain types of cholesterol that comes from maybe processed meat or unhealthy meat, that, are you saying that that can actually raise the cholesterol in your blood? Yes, that is correct. Because you have to remember, all of these, these medicines that they give these chickens, 
not only is for the purpose of making them bigger, people can can enjoy it more, number more number of people can enjoy it more. It's really to bulk it up, to to actually get more bang for your buck. They can sell more. And, and this is low quality feeds that they're actually giving these chickens also. So that's why, yeah, when you mentioned about the name, uh, the term processed, uh, these are artificial. It's already a big no on your end if you're seeing that uh, on your chicken itself. So, I mean, that... I mean, I think we all know that if you're feeding a chicken seed oils or, you know, bad mm -hmm. food or any animal, I mean, it's yeah, kind of true. Food. It's kind of true that you are what you eat, but couldn't there be multiple other problems and multiple other reasons why you might develop cancer if you're eating unhealthy fed meats? Right. So that's definitely true. What I've seen also is, of course, you cannot deny your genetics for sure. If there is a, a, a for example, a breast cancer gene, right? Definitely, you're going to be more prone compared to the normal population. If if somebody has a history of cancer, like liver cancer in the family, right? Um, that can also. My my father had it. That's why I'm pretty cautious about checking my own liver enzymes as well. Um, and even toxicology. If you're exposed to a lot of metals, chemicals around you. Uh, those definitely can be procarcinogenic. So that's why you're right. Food is only one of the risk factors here. And this, these studies made a head-to-head -head correlation of one plus one equals two, rather than one, uh, one plus one plus two plus three equals one. So uh, I, I, I do agree with you, Steve. There are so many factors that can predict uh, cancer for somebody. Right. So um, <clears throat> what now you brought in the you know, the genetics part of this, you know, everyone's different. What if, what if somebody doesn't eat any cholesterol? Well, we know that cholesterol has a benefit to the body too. We know that we right. need some cholesterol or you're dead. Right. Mm -hmm. But just for argument's sake, let's say somebody eats no cholesterol and their cholesterol is high. That's possible, right? That is, that is possible. Does that have the same think? correlation to these types of cancers, even if someone eats no cholesterol? Well, the thing here is, realistically speaking, when you talk about no cholesterol, uh, it's really hard to do that. Um, it's it's uh, I, I can't the realistic conversation that I have with my patients who wants to modify their diet is really more of minimizing cholesterol, just because even a nut, let's say like you eat a peanut, there's there's cholesterol in there, even the smallest amount. The only thing of a problem here is your genetics. So let's say your genetic pool tells you that one drop of, of, uh, of oil or cholesterol would be multiplied when it gets absorbed, meaning 10 times absorption. It's faster, it's just sucking everything in. But there are uh, normal genes that would say, ah, we'll just get like 5% of that or 10% of that, and we'll eliminate the other ones. So that's why you're right. Even with people who are actually limiting their, their uh, intake of cholesterol, uh, could still show up high on a blood test because now this is genetically predetermined. It's not because they ate so many. And in this study, it's not talking about, <clears throat> okay, that's an increased risk of heart disease. That's an increased mm -hmm. risk of cancer. That is correct. And uh, I can actually give you some, some numbers here. Here's a good example. So I mentioned to you basically everything on the cancer board that can be related to, um, to, to cholesterol. But here's one specific. So for, for example, um, when I mentioned about uh, endometrial cancer, right, and throat cancer, the consumption, um, uh, eating, meaning more cholesterol consumption uh, is actually uh, defined as 6% increase for every 100 milligrams extra a day. So daily, if you convert that to lay terms, one daily omelet might increase cancer risk by about 20% uh, in terms of that, that normal level. And again, uh, another example for you would be pancreatic cancer, one of the more deadlier types of cancers out there, an 8% risk for every 100 milligrams of cholesterol. And that would be almost 30% higher risk, um, again, using a, a daily omelet, right? And again, this is not something that they dig, dug into the genetic absorption of, of, a, of, a, of a body uh, of, in the study, but they're just giving more of an idea on, on how much uh, this can increase in terms of giving 
uh, people an idea. Like an omelet is easy to remember rather than a, a hundred milligrams a day, right? Okay, so how do you, as a physician, use this information? I, and look, I know everybody's got their own doctors and they got to talk to their own doctors and they have their own relationships with their own doctors. But how do you, as a physician, use this information to consult your patients? I mean, do you have certain blood work? Are you looking for certain things? Do you advise them on what not to eat or what to eat? Or how do you use this information in your practice? Right. So in, in this uh, evidence that we have, being Steve, being an evidence, evidence-based practitioner, I always tell now this to my patients as, let this be a guide for you on how you eat. Meaning uh, there's a lot of, for example, a lot of carnivores out there. I'm not against carnivores. I just tell them, all right, make sure you're checking your blood work, uh, making sure that you're not overdoing this. And at the same time also, hey, don't forget about our, our friends that are leafy, the leafy greens, the, the vegetables, the fibers. We need to have um, a, a, mo like a moderate intake of everything. And you heard of the phrase that moderation is key. That's why, sure, carnivore is okay but add in the other things that were missing in that specific labeled diet. Uh, and also, um, the, it's, it's just harder for when you talk about um, the understanding of why cholesterol, what is in cholesterol that's making this happen? Because cholesterol, if you could imagine that it's inflammatory, definitely if it's in excess, if it's uh, now becoming abdominal fat, right? And then also, it's also what we call, an, um, it changes your hormones meaning in the endometrial cancer example for you, that is actually producing more bad estrogens for women when you have excessive amount of uh, cholesterol. And it's very oxidative. When you have uh, co excess cholesterol in the body, you're creating a lot of these free radicals that can actually destroy DNA and change them and make them a little bit more dangerous for, for, uh, for normal cells to grow. So these are the, the teaching points that I have when, when we discuss about cholesterol in relation to cancer. So uh, I think I hear you saying that you talk about their diet um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you have them do their blood work and all that stuff and you monitor. And plus, I know that uh, I know this because you monitor my blood work. I know that just because something's in a normal range, sometimes it's a red flag for you if you notice it go up and it still might be very solid in the normal range. But you've mm -hmm. told me, hey, this is high for you. It's not high, but it's high for you because you're normally down here, right? right? Right. That's correct. Okay. So you're monitoring these people's blood work. And then from there, you're consulting them individually on what you think their diet should be, or maybe asking them about their diet. That's right. So that's where individualization comes into play. When you're talking about patients, everybody's different. And that's why... I disagree with these algorithms that somebody shows up in your door and this is immediately what you're going to give them. You have to factor in uh, different things like uh, the person's habits, the environment, the genetics. So not one medicine will cure the same disease. So when, when I mentioned to you about you, for example, I always I want to make sure I compare it to your old blood work to see how you respond. Because you'd be surprised. I've seen carnivores that has normal cholesterol. And it's like, wow. And I've seen other carnivores that are like off the charts. So it's really different for everyone. And that's why when I mentioned this, that's why I'm, I'm not saying cholesterol is bad. You just have to make sure you check. Yeah. No, that answers my question. Just for all you listen, I'm not a carnivore, but um, that kind of answers my question on how you relate this information to the uniqueness of your patients. So any anything lastly that you would add about this doctor before we go yeah don't be afraid about cholesterol there's nothing to fear about it it's definitely uh, it's so beneficial it can be turned turned into hormones it's actually used by our brain tissue it's something that we use for energy for ketones that's why do not be afraid of it you just have to understand that in excess it can be a little bit dangerous that's why we're here, you're there getting educated about these things in order for us to prevent these specific complications. Sure. I mean, I, I think scientists, science knows that 
without cholesterol, you were all dead. So right. <laughs> it is important. So, um, Dr. Nario, thank you so much for your input and we will talk to you next time. Well, thank you, Steve, for having me again. As we all know that our knowledge is your power to better health. And thank you for letting me provide you with ed edge on longevity and health maintenance, which I call the biological edge or the bio edge.